If you're studying for the INBDE, I highly recommend INBDE Bootcamp, an all-in-one study resource that will help you pass your exam. Use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral diagnosis series. Let's keep learning about more developmental disturbances in the head and neck region and how to diagnose them appropriately. So in this video, we'll talk about developmental anomalies involving the mucosa and the gingiva. Now, for clarity, in the previous video on the lips and the palate, we talked about lesions like a melanotic macule that can also occur on the mucosa and the gingiva. It's just more common to see those on the lips specifically, hence why I had it in that video. Similarly, some of the things we talk about in this video can also occur on other surfaces like the lips, like the palate, but they are going to primarily appear on the mucosa and gingiva, hence how I've organized this series so far. My hope is by organizing these conditions into their primary location and the tissues that they primarily affect, they'll be easier to compartmentalize as you learn them and then easier to remember for test day. First up are the Fordyce granules. Fordyce granules or Fordyce spots are enlarged, slightly raised, sebaceous or oil producing glands that appear in hairless skin or mucosa. They look like little granules of sugar, these little whitish yellow bumps. The most common perioral area is around the edges of your lips called the vermilion border and the most common intraoral area is inside your cheeks on the buccal mucosa. These bumps are completely harmless and completely painless. However, there is some interesting research that indicates Fordyce granules may be an indicator of hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol because individuals with an elevated lipid profile tend to have the highest amount of clinically detectable Fordyce granules. I have another fun memory tip for you. We have four dice, so think of a die with lots of spots and dots on it, and then a pile of granulated sugar, which looks like the collection of raised sebaceous glands. So we have four dice, sugar granules. Next up is leukoedema. Leuco means white, just like a leukocyte is a white blood cell, and edema means fluid retention. The exact cause of this condition is unknown, but it is thought to be the result of intracellular edema of the superficial epithelial cells in addition to the presence of parakeratin. Parakeratin refers to extra layers of the keratin protein that retain their nuclei. Leukoedema presents as a white, grayish white, or sometimes bluish white edematous lesion on the buccal mucosa. It almost always appears bilaterally on the inside of both cheeks. Interestingly, it dissipates or disappears when the cheek is blanched or stretched, like here with the mouth mirror. This helpful feature differentiates it from other similar looking lesions like lichen planus or leukoplakia, for instance. It is considered a variation of normal mucosa and has no notable associated symptoms. It more frequently occurs in black patients, suggesting that the condition may have an ethnic predilection. Before we continue, I have to tell you about this incredible AI study tool that will help quiz you on what you're learning in this video, and it's called Wisdolia. It'll give you an outline, flashcards, and even case scenario questions customized from this video. And as you answer the questions, you'll get personalized feedback to tell you exactly what you got right, what you got wrong, and why. You can find the Wisdolia link in the description below. Now, back to the video. 
Next is idiopathic gingival fibromatosis. This is an uncommon benign hereditary condition. Sometimes it's also called hereditary gingival fibromatosis. This word idiopathic is interesting. It means we don't know what causes it. And frankly, I remember this term by remembering that we are an idiot about the pathology, meaning we don't know what the root cause of this pathology is. So idiopathic, gingival, it affects the gums, fibromatosis, referring to fibrous enlargement. So it's a slowly progressive condition that leads to gradual fibrous enlargement of both the maxillary and mandibular keratinized attached gingiva. The expanded gums are pink, firm, painless, and non-hemorrhagic. And while we don't know an exact cause, we do know it involves an increase in the number of fibroblasts and an increased production of collagen and fibronectin, in addition to a reduction in the matrix metalloproteinases that degrade collagen. So we're getting a lot of thick protein production, building up, causing this fibrous enlargement. And although this gingival enlargement is considered benign and has no direct effect on the alveolar bone underneath, this excess tissue can make it easier for plaque to accumulate on the teeth, leading to possible gingivitis and periodontitis and halitosis. The thickened tissue can also cause displacement of the teeth, leading to diastemas like you see here, or could limit eruption of teeth, leading to impaction like what's happening over here. And lastly, we have the retrocuspid papilla. A retrocuspid papilla is a smooth, soft, well-defined, round, or oval swelling on the lingual attached gingiva near the mandibular canines. Usually, they are located just below the free gingival margin. Retrocuspid papillae are found most commonly on both the left and right sides, so another bilateral lesion, but are sometimes just on one side as well. It's usually pink or red matching the surrounding gingiva. It's usually about one to three millimeters in diameter and height, and it may appear as a dome-shaped nodule like you see here, or sometimes it's more of a pedunculated lesion, meaning it occurs on a stalk like the head of a mushroom. It's currently believed to be a normal anatomic variant behind the mandibular canines, but interestingly, these lesions look a lot like giant cell fibromas, both in the mouth and under the microscope, because they have stellate or star-shaped multinucleated fibroblasts, or giant cells, which is a prominent histologic feature of the giant cell fibroma. But as of now, we're calling this a variant of normal anatomy. That's it for this video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate it. I'd also really appreciate if you consider clicking that like button below this video, subscribing to the channel if you have not already, sharing this video with your friends, and leaving a comment below letting me know what you thought. All of those things can really help to grow the channel. If you want to go above and beyond supporting me and what I do here, please check out the Patreon page linked below. If you want to join there, you'll get access to exclusive practice questions, exclusive study guides, a Discord server, and so, so much more. And if you see at the end of my videos, I have an end credits screen, and all of those names there are the names of my amazing Patreon supporters that I'm honored to have. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.